So welcome to everyone um, to this first webinar. Uh, Emerald's project uh, will develop a series of webinars during the next months. Uh, this is the first one. So we are kicking off our series with uh, a first introductive general, but a very concrete intensive one. Um, unlocking the power of urban mobility data is the, um, let's say the title of this webinar and the core of the uh, topic that we want to develop now in the future. So uh, just a, a few uh, things from me. Um, um, the, today I'm Maria Letizia Mari of uh, Trust IT. With me there is uh, Zach Smith from uh, my, uh, the same organization. And there is the agenda here. You can see uh, it will be one hour with a general introduction uh, of, the, um, of the Emeralds project uh, made by Fivos Galatulas of Inlecom, which is the, um, the organization uh, that coordinate the project. So for Fivos is uh, the, co the project coordinator. Then we will uh, follow with uh, a session uh, um, um, focus on the tool set, the scope and objectives made by uh, Yanis Theodoridis from University of Piraeus. Um, uh, that is the Emerald's scientific and technical coordinator of the project. Uh, after that, there will be uh, the, the uh, very focused uh, session on the uh, pilots. So we have three use cases um, that will be introduced by Sasha Ogedom Lancer. And uh, the three pilots are about three cities, The Hague, uh, Rotterdam, and Riga. So we will see better then. Um, we also have a Q and A discussion at the end. Um, so please, you are very welcome to uh, start uh, posing your questions uh, in the Q&A session, uh, for the Q&A session. So please um, do it uh, on the, the Zoom tool that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, start doing uh, even now if you want, and we will try to reply to that uh, after, uh, at the end of the session. Then, uh, just a few tips. The webinar will be recorded and uh, will be shared on the Emerald website and the YouTube channel of the project and the slides of the speakers will be shared after the webinar. So I uh, start, um, I mean, I start sharing and I pass the floor to Fivos Galatulas for the um, general introduction of the Emerald project. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Maria Letizia, and uh, greetings from my side. I'm Fivos Galatulas. I am a project manager at Inlecom Innovation, which is the entity coordinating the Emerald project. I would like to welcome you all today, where we launch our series of webinars uh, on extreme scale urban mobility data analytics, which is also the main positioning and focus of the project. Um, some key figures on Emeralds. Emeralds kickstarted on the 1st of January of 2023. It's funded under the Horizon Cluster for data topics and it's a research and innovation action. Its duration is expected to be 36 months uh, with a consortium comprising of 19 partners originating from 10 countries. Um, its developments will be showcased and validated throughout four cities. Uh, two Dutch cities, one city in Latvia, and the follow-up uh, adoption demonstrator in the city of York. And the uh, commission's um, group that is uh, monitoring the progress of the project is uh, the director general 
for communication networks, content technology, DigiConnect. Now, coming to where the project positions itself in the current research landscape, Emeralds is under the objective, the mission, to develop trustworthy, accurate, green, and fair AI systems. So we embark on a journey uh, transforming unstructured, complex data uh, with extreme properties and uh, ending up to distilling this information into meaningful insights that can be used for, her from hu for human use uh, with uh, fair properties where we aim to deliver groundbreaking advances, uh, such as in the performance, speed, accuracy, and usefulness of data discovery, collection, mining, filtering, and processing, addressing the gaps of state-of-the-art technologies, and trying to um, contribute where uh, current technologies and um, research developments have failed. So, um, what is the underlying motivation of Emeralds? Emeralds motivated by the imperative to harness and optimize the digital evolution to enhance mobility services. We recognize the search in data-driven mobility services, such as shared mobility apps and fleet operating systems. And therefore, we aim to be at the forefront of integrating and optimizing these services for more efficient urban mobility. Uh, we also acknowledge the importance of data spaces and distribute the computing environments towards these ends but also to contribute to the decarbonization of urban mobility uh, by means of optimizing routes, modes, and services so as to minimize the environmental impact of the overall transport system in cities. In addition to enhancing comfort for mobility users, uh, we also place uh, safety and security as integral motivators of uh, our advancements and activities, where uh, we place a strong emphasis on building trustworthy systems that prioritize also the well-being of users. So what are these uh, characteristics that state the project's data as extreme? Uh, often, data related to urban mobility in modern cyber-physical systems deployed around European cities are extreme in terms of volume, uh, feature uh, extreme velocities. Uh, also, if we take the um, example of autonomous vehicles that generate, let's say, some amount of terabytes um, per second, and we have um, a main characteristic of heterogeneity, meaning that this multitude of devices generates data of different formats, types, such as geographical coordinates, but textual information or weather um, forecasts um, that have to be uh, fused and processed in a way that can create meaningful insights for uh, decision makers. So in this direction, the solution proposed by Emeralds is to deliver a palette of services uh, for extreme scale urban mobility data analytics. These services are underpinned by a distributed computing environment that uh, free, um, contemplates the intrinsic features of edge fog nodes, but also cloud nodes and cloud compute, cloud infrastructures. And there, we aim to contribute towards establishing robust data workflows uh, across a multitude of uh, execution environments. Consequently, uh, the project will release a toolset of more than 20 open and reusable software modules. And to this end, the foreseen activities employ key enablers of the computing continuum paradigm such as data virtualization, containerization of services, dynamic deployment, reconfiguration, enhanced data autonomy, automated orchestration, task scheduling, but also trust execution, execution environments and security wrappers on top of data. Uh, here we have an overview of the main tool categories, which will be described in the following presentation. So if we had to describe our ambition in quantitative terms, uh, the overall ambition is to elevate the precision of modeling urban mobility environments. By amalgamating diverse data sources, we aim for an accuracy leap exceeding 30%. This will craft a bit, a, this will enable a modelers to craft detailed digital twins of the urban environment, facilitating, let's say, a profound understanding of city dynamics. Efficiency is also key. So Emerald strives to enhance 
data ingestion by targeting a reduction of over 20% achieved through smart pairing of data streams with a robust storage querying analytics backbone that can act as a data fabric system. Emeralds also pushes the boundaries by porting more than 30% of data processing um, towards the edge, uh, including AI inference. This uh, strategic uh, positioning enhances real-time processing, ensuring applicability across the entire computing continuum. But also, uh, when it comes to privacy, respecting privacy is not uh, negotiable. Therefore, Emeralds is committed to perform over 50% of sensitive data analytics tasks in situ. This means analytics are executed at the data source, eliminating the need for sensitive data to leave its origin. And this approach maximizes, let's say, data locality. So what is the underlying approach that Emeralds aims to follow in order to achieve its objectives and main ambitions? Emeralds is not a siloed project. Emeralds wants to develop tools for end users, including the end users in the project. So this means that we undertake a development approach, uh, including the mobility and city stakeholders, um, towards and guiding them towards improving decision making in urban uh, smart city environments. Uh, through a first round, uh, first Agile development cycle, the toolset's efficiency will be assessed, validated, and demonstrated in three pilot use cases that will be presented in the, se in the second um, succeeding um, presentation of today, where the software modules we reach, are expected to reach a TRL5 uh, maturity. Then uh, the solutions will be further um, showcased in two early adopters data-driven applications uh, in an enhanced maturity level, PRL6, uh, where the most advanced components will be integrated to services of existing systems of these commercial partners in order to assess and validate the improvement at, um, imp um, uh, imposed on their commercial offerings. So a pivotal aspect of the project is its cross-domain adoption and the reusability of its results. Uh, this is driven by a commitment to interoperability by design, um, the adherence to ethical AI principles, so designing ethical AI uh, throughout the packages that have to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. We aim to um, state public authorities and to offer public authorities a tech stack that can permit them to deploy their own analytics as a service data platforms. And um, through our data processing and data workloads, we want to release uh, data, new open data sets with increased data quality. Um, for who is Emeralds creating added value services? Uh, as we see in the right, in the center, we have the source of algorithmic developments, which can be fostered and cross-fertilized with integrators, technology providers, and research and technological organizations, as well as uh, the academy. Uh, in the outer circle, we push these models to data science experts and application developers in order to tailor the solutions in their own real-time um, requirements and design specifications. And at the end of the process, uh, the ones that will be mainly benefited will be public authorities, mobility SMEs, as well as startups. Um, Emerald is not um, a standalone effort, and we aim to align seamlessly with existing EU initiatives, uh, either on data spaces, the European Open Cloud, um, but also the AI on demand platform driven by the European Union. Um, in this way, we will offer a collaborative contribution to a broader European landscape of data analytics and artificial intelligence. So a um, brief look on our consortium, uh, which uh, encapsulates um, harmonious blends of expertise, uh, uniting uh, research partners, 
with uh, leaders in geospatial analytics, commercial leaders in software development, uh, SMEs, mid-caps, uh, but also uh, consulting companies, along with end users such as um, cities, public authorities, and traf transport management um, uh, service, um, service providers. So thank you for your attention. And don't forget to follow us, but also visit our website, emeraldhorizon.eu. Thank you for your attention. Perfect, Pivos. Thank you very much for your contribution and for your interesting uh, uh, presentation. Now is the time of the, of Yanis Tidorikis, uh, which, which is a technical and scientific coordinator of the project. Uh, please, Yanis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria Leticia. Uh, I hope you will see my slides. Yes, and perfectly. Welcome also from my side to our first uh, webinar. I'll try to be brief in order to leave uh, more room uh, to Sasa, our next speaker, to speak uh, in more detail about the use cases. Uh, I will tell you uh, about our tools that we have in mind to develop. Of course, it is the first year uh, of the project, so some is already in progress, some is uh, um, mature, some are ideas. What is the concept, actually? Uh, FIBOS already said that we are talking about urban uh, data. Urban data has a lot of challenges. Uh, it is volume, of course. Uh, we have uh, daily, let's say, data uh, generated, for instance, by autonomous car. We will see more and more in the years to come. We have velocity, um, a lot of uh, high uh, rates of uh, information are generated. We have variety from structured data, GPS uh, signals, for instance, to semi-structured and unstructured data, uh, social media posts, uh, to name a few. Uh, we have also complexity of uh, information, uh, behavioral patterns, uh, time-critical decisions that have to be uh, made. We have sensitive data. We are talking about people. We are talking about humans traveling and uh, what is uh, the privacy let's say dimension uh, it is very important very critical and uh, for sure we have heterogeneous uh, data information from uh, iot devices from uh, uh, traffic cameras uh, and so on and so forth so emeralds tries to cover most of these aspects in uh, and, and uh, envisions uh, what we call a uh, mobility analytics as a service uh, ecosystem consisting of uh, our emeralds. We have uh, used this uh, name. Uh, what are our uh, emeralds? Uh, they will be services that will be able to collect spatial temporal data, uh, reduce data ingestion times analyze this data with AI machine learning uh, advanced techniques, visualize uh, the results of uh, our analysis in the active dashboards. And of course, as we mentioned before, since we're talking about sensitive data, try to do some analytics in situ. Uh, we have four objectives in the project, uh, talking from the technical uh, uh, side. Our first objective is to design a service or the edit architecture. And this is a first uh, screenshot of what is more or less will be our uh, architecture. The important is that we, it will span the entire edge for the cloud computing continuum. Uh, our second objective is to develop uh, the so-called emeralds from uh, edge analytics and explain AI techniques uh, to privacy uh, aware staff, uh, to mobility data fusion and management staff, to security data governance, to uh, mobility AI as a service platform. Third objective is to develop our AI ML tools uh, using the well-defined data ops, ML ops, DevOps uh, guidelines, 
and this is a vertical technology integration approach in a two agile development cycles with a continuous improvement of uh, the components that are developed. And our fourth objective, and this will be the main, let's say, menu of uh, this uh, webinar in the presentation that will follow, is to demonstrate our results. Uh, demonstrate them in uh, three use cases and uh, validate them uh, through two early adoption uh, demonstrators. So we will develop our uh, emeralds. Uh, we will uh, validate them uh, and uh, show their usefulness in uh, three use cases. It is uh, the hug, it is uh, the, the town of Rotterdam, and it is the city of uh, Riga. I don't go into the details to uh, uh, leave uh, room to Sasa. And uh, these are, let's say, TRL up to five, and then we come to the uh, early adoption uh, demonstrators. Uh, the first one is about Mobility Cloud Analytics as a service provider. The second one is about traffic modeling and flow optimization commercial suites. Uh, where our target is to reach uh, up to uh, TRL6. So all this flow from uh, the emeralds that we are going to develop uh, these uh, three years to the real, let's say, implementation and uh, uh, validation in the three pilots and the two uh, early adoption, uh, adopters will be our uh, roadmap for the next uh, months to come. I try to be uh, fast, <laughs> Maria Leticia, uh, to uh, let Sasa uh, uncover, let's say, the potential from the use case uh, aspect. Thank you all. Uh, I will be back to you for questions uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis. Yes. Uh, uh... Very concise but important uh, aspects uh, during your presentation. In the meantime, Sasha Ugedon Lancer uh, is preparing her um, presentation. She introduced uh, the uh, pilots um, session. So, are you ready? Yes. yes. Hi, Anne. Can Thank you... you very much. The floor is yours, Sasha. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, perfectly. Oh, perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Foyvos and Janus. Um, let me start with what you call the use cases. I'm more inclined to, word, to use the word challenges. I think all of the three pilots or use cases have elements that are coming from real life and are really in need of solutions. And hopefully the emeralds that we're developing together will bring us a step closer to these solutions. Uh, my name is Sasha Hogenhorn. I work for TU Delft as director of the Mobility Innovation Center. And I'm in charge of work package five in which we have the three use cases as well as, as the assessment of the, the impact of the emeralds uh, on these use cases. The first, a uh, use case I'd like to present is about estimating and predicting crowdedness and the risks related to that crowdedness on the coastal area of the city of The Hague. Um, to show you how pressing the problem is to have good estimates, good predictions of crowds as well as risks, I just took an, um, a newspaper article that I could quickly find. I think in the Netherlands, we have the most beautiful sandy beach coastline of the world, but it's not all just fun and joy. There are problems that are, I think, related on the one hand to the crowdedness, to the heat, the lack of parking spaces due, due to the after corona math. I'm not sure what it is, but, it, but what you can see that in order to, in some way, manage, mitigate, control problems that arise at our beautiful beaches, we need to have better insights uh, into the crowdedness and the risks and better to have predictions so we can be more proactive. For people who don't know uh, the Netherlands, I think all of you might have heard about um, the Halloween festivities that went terribly wrong in Seoul last time. Um, there was, that had nothing to do with 
people being in a bad mood. Everybody was excited. It was the first time of having these festivities after two years of Corona. But why did it go wrong in the end? I think it was simply about having too many people at the same point at the same time. So also here, if you would have had predictions, even if it would have been 15 minutes ahead about the direction of the crowds and about the crowdedness in the certain streets, we could have been looking for ways to direct uh, pedestrians, ways to lock off certain streets and at least make the problem a bit better. Hopefully I showed you that it's not just use cases that we're looking into, but it's our urgent problems and the emeralds can play an important role in that. Um, what you're looking at on the right side while I'm talking is a movie made by one of the partners, uh, Archeleo, um, that uh, make a beautiful 3D visualization of all of the historic data, the real-time data, but also the uh, first predictions that we have made together uh, with the city of The Hague, the National Police, TU Delft and Archeleo uh, last year. Um, and and just, take, just take a look at it and I keep, uh, keep talking on the, on the slides. Um, I think regular and non-regular events present various challenges to authorities and to emergency people. They need to plan their scarce personnel. Specifically, if it's hot summer days, you do not only have the city of Scheveningen, but you have a full coastal line of about 80 to 100 kilometers wide where you do need the same type of personnel. You want all people working uh, on crowd management in these types of situations to have the same common operational picture. And there is a, a need for real-time interventions, proactive interventions to prevent dangerous situations from happening. So the main question is, can we develop a data-driven decision support tool or set of tools that can help these decision makers and emergency services? Data, but I would rather say information is essential. And then I'm specifically looking at two types of information. On the one hand, real-time information, uh, include, including short-term predictions uh, of crowds and risks that can be used in operations. So to take actual measures if needed. And at the same time, information in the form of uh, midterm forecasts, seven or 10 days ahead, that already gives you information about what crowds are to be expected in seven or 10 days and whether or not there are risks associated with that. And that type of forecasting can be used for planning purposes, for example, to determine how much personnel to have available on a certain day. It all sounds logical. Why is it not there? And I think data is a big problem in that. Uh, when we first started the Emeralds project, I had some discussions with the colleagues in the project who simply asked me, why not use smart cameras? Um, there's a reason for that. They're pretty expensive and they only provide localized data. So in order to cover only just the beach and Scheveningen, you need a lot, let alone if you want to cover the whole coastal zone, city centers and others as well. What we can also use is what we call location-based data services. That's data coming from apps that use positioning data, but that data is coarse. It depends on the amount of people using their smartphone and the apps on these smartphones but also sometimes buyers. It might in certain situations underestimate crowding levels. A lot of the data sources that we have provide us with privacy challenges that we need to overcome if we want to look at uh, a broader use than just in this specific use case. And what we don't know yet, but that's because a lot of these data sources are relatively new, is which data sources are precisely needed to come up with an accurate and reliable assessment of uh, the risks. So what does use case one aim at? It aims to demonstrate what the impact is of enriching that crowdedness and data related to crowdedness using all of these new uh, advanced data analytics applications that are going to be developed in, um, in the Emeralds project. 
two terms I uh, highlighted. First of all, the system needs to be secure. And the second important thing is, is that the system needs to be scalable. So that means try to use data sources that are broadly available and don't focus too much on these incidental data sets that you can come across at a certain location. Um, just two quick examples. Um, if you look at the top picture, you're looking at a picture of a certain area from sale in Amsterdam from a couple of years ago. Uh, and what the dots are, they are locations where people send tweets. So we don't look at the content of the tweets, we just look when and where they do their tweeting. Um, and if you look at the picture in the bottom right, just look at the two top lines. And the first one is the baseline, the blue line. That's the amount of, that's a density that has been determined using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cameras that were on site. And the red line is based on a model using just the locations and the times of the tweets. And what you can see is that even using that type of information can give you a good estimate of um, the, the density at certain locations. Uh, what do we expect from Emeralds? What kind of functions are we hoping to be using in a couple of years time? On the one hand, to get highly accurate and reliable estimates of the crowding levels using uh, combinations of available data sources. Rizono, which is that location-based data, probably some camera data, social media data. Not just looking at crowds, but also a good estimate of risk levels. On the one hand, com combining the level of crowdedness that we can estimate, but at the same time, also a multitude of other data sources, sentiment data that you can get from posts and images, uh, weather data or changes in weather data, data from events, from traffic conditions, from parking occupancies. And up, uh, on top of estimates of crowding levels and risk levels, we also hope to get accurate and reliable predictions and forecasts that we can use both in operations and for planning support. How to determine, and we have had uh, recently a lot of discussions about this in, uh, within the project, how to determine the impact of the different emeralds that are going to be developed in a project. It's not easy to say. If you have travel time of 10 minutes, that you can re re uh, reduce and up to eight minutes by implementing certain tools, that's easy to say. But how do you say that if you're going to improve safety or if you're hoping to reduce the impact of incidents and nuisances. How are you able to um, quantify that impact? So what we're looking at is what we call a value chain. We start from data and the first couple of emeralds are um, putting the data into uh, information. For example, like I said, the estimates, the predictions, the forecasts. Based on that information, crowd managers and others can come up with better actions, both operational and in planning. And these actions have a certain impact. For example, the improved safety or a cost reduction. But that means in order to be able to determine what these impacts are, we have to talk with uh, the real experts who are in the field and um, have to do with all these types of things on a daily basis. What we also want to take into account, apart from what's going to happen within this use case, is to look at scalability and rollout of the system that we're developing. And then you can, of course, think of other coastal cities, but you can also think whether or not these new uh, techniques can be used, for example, in city centers, at uh, pop concerts, other types of events. This is my first use case. So I'm quickly stopping the sharing. And then I go directly towards the second presentation. I'm a bit in a hurry, my apologies for that. Uh, I have two use cases to go. The first was on crowds and risks. The second one is from my hometown, Rotterdam. I'm a big fan. Um, and it's on multimodal traffic uh, management. Use case two is about what we call active network-wide multimodal traffic control. It's a mouthful, so let's go through the three items 
one by one. With active, we mean using real-time data and information. With network-wide, we mean the area-wide coordination between all of the different um, traffic management elements. That can be traffic lights, it can be real-time traffic information given to people. And with multimodal, we mean that we're not looking like we did 10, 15 years ago, only into cars, but also into public transportation, cyclists, pedestrians, but also the users of all new types of mobility services that are becoming available nowadays. Doing that, we're keeping a close eye on the policy objectives of the city of Rotterdam, who want to become, for example, more bike friendly. They want to improve the livability of their inhabitants. They want to improve travel times and travel time reliability, but also stay an accessible city. Um, how are we going to do that? By influencing the multimodal traffic flow operations via on the one hand control and on the other hand information provision. And just some examples, for example, coordinating uh, the different intersections, one adjacent to the other. Uh, state of the art control strategies combining intersection control and micro routing. Um, if you have a large roundabout, your car traffic is always going into one direction, but with respect, for example, before your um, pedestrians and cyclists, you can send them clockwise, but also counterclockwise, depending on the destination on the other hand end of that large roundabout. So that's something to keep in mind as well. We can look at conditional priorities for buses at intersections and weather dependent control strategies. For example, giving cyclists earlier right of way when uh, it's raining cats and dogs. Again, I kept the same structure for all three use cases, data, or better said information in this case is key to design strategies and real-time control for multimodal uh, traffic networks. If we look at data issues in this case, they're a bit different. Um, what we can say is that active mode uh, data, as well as public transportation data are often uh, unreliable and incomplete. Um, the data that we need about cars, for example, queue lengths in front of intersections require expensive data collection techniques. Predictions so far of multimodal traffic conditions are often inaccurate. And the same as we had with use case number one, uh, there are privacy challenges that we have to deal with in order to make sure that uh, what we developed can be uh, used on a broader scale. Um, use case two aims to demonstrate the impact of enriching the traffic data this case by estimating, uh, classifying, predicting, forecasting, again, using these advanced data analytics applications, using the multitude of multimodal traffic data that we have available. I show you two pictures here. The picture on the top shows you the, the, the tiny blue line are, is the, the real queue lengths in front of a certain intersection and the red one is um, the estimate that has been made from that, for that queue length using floating car data and loop detector data. And what you do see is that it closely resembles the actual queue length, but with uh, a fraction of the costs that the expensive radar system cost you. What you see at the bottom, and that's also, I think, a very important uh, thing that we're going to do within the Emeralds project, is looking how to uh, improve control and routing strategies uh, for cyclists. We have uh, different sources of data when it comes to cycling, but they're uh, sparse. Uh, sometimes we have loop detectors in bicycle path. We have what we call vehicle logging data from traffic lights. And we have a system that used to be working. It's not working currently, which was called talking bike, uh, in which um, apps were used uh, by cyclists when cycling through the Netherlands. And if you look at the picture on the, the bottom left, you see all of the raw data that has been mapped on the right side uh, to the map of Rotterdam. And that gives you a lot of information on which bicycle routes are used more uh, extensively. Um, 
what do we again think of getting from the Emeralds project for this use case? That is, um, and I think Janis mentioned it also earlier, it's privacy secure handling of data. In our case, the data, the vehicle loggings over chip car data, the talking bike data, highly accurate and reliable estimates of multimodal traffic states using a combination of data sources in such a way that it can nationally wide be deployed. The, so the three sources that I mentioned, NDW, NDOV, and VELOG are all data sources that are widely available. And then the last part, and I think that's, I'm not even sure if I've been able to bring this argument across to the group good enough over the last couple of months that we've been working together. Accurate and reliable predictions and forecasts for active traffic management operations and planning. Like I, um, if we look at the right part of the slide, short term network wide prediction of traffic states using all these types of different data is a holy grail in traffic management. I say holy grail because it allows us to have a proactive response to bottlenecks in the network. Bottlenecks tend to propagate through a network quickly. So if you are able to mitigate that as quickly as possible, we will have a huge impact on traffic uh, in a city. What we could also do is test different proactive strategies that require predictions uh, for traffic conditions for each of these possible strategies. So if we can, for a certain situation, test these different strategies, we can optimize and we can decide which strategy is the best to implement, something that we currently can't. And the last part is not only looking at the, the network in this case of Rotterdam, but compare it to other networks and see what we can learn from that by combining and comparing specific situations. The last slide I go through quickly, I mentioned the value chain already for use case number one. Uh, of course, in this case, uh, the data is different, the information, the actions and impacts are different, but more or less the way of doing things is the same. There's one thing that I want to highlight. In this case, I have uh, enhanced data or information. Uh, with uh, In use case one, we only talked about information because in these cases, it's often always a person, it's always a person looking at the information and taking the action. If you look at a traffic control system, you will have data that is enhanced, but directly goes into a traffic management system without a person ever seeing the data. Only the relevant information gets to uh, the traffic managers. Yet again, this was use case uh, number two. We have uh, one to go. If you want more information about the use cases, I have to say this use case we've been working on together with um, Alexander Schmitz from Arana and Sesha Hogendorn from, uh, from TU Delft. So if you have questions, please, uh, please let us know and we can uh, help, you, uh, help you further with that. And you can use, um, yeah, it's working. Uh, also the Emeralds website as a starting point. The third use case is from Riga. It's completely different from the other two. It's more closely related to mobility policy and to design of public transportation networks. From what I've heard from my colleagues from Riga, Jurius and Christine, who are doing a main part of this work from Group 93, it's, it should be beautiful. So hopefully we, I get the opportunity to, uh, to go there. What I hear from them is that there is a relatively good public transportation system in Riga in place, at least if you look at numbers. They have five trams, 21 trolley buses, they have 51 buses, and a lot of kilometers are traveled, and the system has a lot of passengers. If you look at the top picture, you see all of the different uh, stops in the Riga area for, the public, for, for, for public transport. And if you look at the bottom, you see the network of buses running through uh, Riga. But there is a problem. It's not all good. Um, what they saw before 2017, they saw an increase in the use of public transportation as primary means of transport in the city and in its outskirts. Uh, after Corona, there was a large drop in the percentage of people still using public transportation. It went down 
from 90.1% to 11.5%. I can say that this is not unique for Riga. It's the same, for example, in the Netherlands, but also in other European countries. But I have to say that the, de the decrease is relatively big compared to what we see in the Netherlands. They also have other problems with relation to, for example, public transportation. They have high mobility costs in Riga. Public transportation uh, often doesn't have separated lanes, which means that um, if there's congestion, the buses are standing in the same, same queues as, as the car traffic, which leads to time losses for the travelers in the buses. And there is a lack of uh, emission lowering initiatives. Yet again, data or better said information is in this case key for effective mobility planning and public transportation network design in the city of Riga. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, uh, to say this, but I think the first step and it's politically sensitive is a shift in focus from car to public transport. And uh, that's something that's needed, I think, to make public transport more attractive to their users by optimizing the transportation network and its efficiency. For example, to give public transport priority, to have dedicated public transport lanes, to make the public transport system more adaptive to changes, quick changes, but also to future demand. But, and I think most importantly, to provide evidence to policymakers and politicians um, the, on which locations the reorganization of the public transportation network uh, will yield the large, largest benefits. So to look at the costs and the benefits based on that, make uh, informed decisions. Um, I'm a bit jealous if I look at the Riga situation, although they might think, uh, think differently themselves. They have access to um, uh, uh, data, to um, um, uh, the traveling card data. Only the data are not complete. So only they have part of the entry, the exit, and the transfer points validated uh, for the different routes. And at the same time, as we have in the Netherlands, of course, there are challenges when it comes to privacy aspects of these data. But like I said, they at least have a good starting point that we are jealous for in, uh, in the Netherlands. So what do we uh, aim for in use case three is to demonstrate the impact again of these data analytics applications, but in this case, to infer trip characteristics using the ticketing data that I was just talking about, the GPS data of the different public transportation vehicles, timetable information. And again, uh, I, I, I keep uh, emphasizing it to come up with a system that's scalable and secure. Just some examples, extracting, for example, meaningful information about chip duration of people, about the route choices that people make, about transfer patterns, where the people do transfer, about passenger preferences, when to travel, how to travel, where to travel. And for example, raising the number of validated entries. At this point, Rupa has already done a lot of work in that. They come to 70, 80% of validated entry points for public transportation travelers. The number of validated exits is a bit lower and what they want in the end from the Emeralds project to come close to that 100%. So you have a clear picture of all of the trips that are going to be made or are being made within the city of Riga. And in such a way that you're able to determine where best to invest and make changes to the system. Again, the value chain approach can be applied to Riga as well. Uh, we have not discussed that with them uh, yet, but I think it's one of the things that we can do. Uh, so I won't go into detail uh, for that. One of the things that might be easier in this uh, specific use case to, uh, to determine in real life is how much travel time is lost in public transportation. If you have a good estimate of the amount of people inside buses, trolley buses and trams, you know how much the ladies' vehicles have, then, it's, um, then you can determine what the impact would be. And yet again, look at scalability and at rollout. I will stop my presentation here. Please ask me, uh, approach us if you have uh, questions.
Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, thank you, thank uh, you for the opportunity to, uh, of, to present all three use cases. Yes, yes, it was a very valuable uh, a presentation, um, a, a real touch, let's say, of everyday life also. And uh, I mean, a vision and a view on how um, they can be improved. I mean, our lives can be improved from the steps uh that uh, uh MRL is, is developing at various levels so this is very very uh rich presentation and thank you again um we have um a, a couple of questions i leave the floor to zach which is gathering the the questions from the audience and uh yeah go all right, so um, a question for uh, Fivos and Yanis, and whichever one of you feels to answer this. What are the major current demands, pain points, and challenges and influencing factors shaping the technological landscape of the computing continuum? Fivo? Uh, Yanis, if you want to... Sorry. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, you are right that it is, uh, there are very many challenges here. Actually, <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> let, do not forget that our project is a, a research and innovation project. So starts from a low TRL, which uh, practically means that we have to develop uh, algorithms that will work uh, smoothly on real data and validate it in, in our use cases. So there has been a lot of work in data analytics, in mobility data analytics, but this work has mostly been performed in uh, centralized systems and in the cloud. There is a lot to be done at the edge. Uh, if I had to select one uh, big challenge for the project is how to efficiently and effectively perform uh, data analytics uh, for instance, privacy aware data analytics uh, in situ at the edge level and smoothly pass the information, the knowledge actually, uh, to the other uh, layers, fog and continue. Uh, I could say much more, but just looking at the clock, uh, I would uh, stop uh, here and I don't know if people would like to add this evidence. Yeah, Thank I, you, would, I, would, I would add that there are mainly technological hurdles and obstacles that relate to the vendor lock-in effects of devices and the way they structure their data exchange and sharing on 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 the on top of the devices. But also we have to take into account the low latency uh, of the applications that are envisioned for uh, future urban mobility systems, uh, where edge analytics will be essential into meeting this requirement. Thank you, Foivos. Um, uh, and, and one for Sasha, are there any other particular sectors that you see um, ripe for collaborative efforts in the mobility and transportation sectors uh, within the community and continuum? So maybe apart from the the specific use cases you've talked about? Um, there's a lot of talking about uh, autonomous cars. Uh, that would not be the first sector I would think about because I'm not fully sure if we're in the end heading towards having autonomous cars in the city center. At the same time, I think that we're at the beginning of getting data available. And I think we're just at the beginning of that road. And there's so much data at this point, we're only looking at um, data for person mobility, but what if we going to combine uh, logistics, um, first less mile and um, uh, person mobility, for example. I think that the, the opportunities are huge. And um, one of the things that I think is important, we talk a lot about privacy. I've been talking with some of the colleagues within the project also now about security. And I think that's very important as well. And it's not only just the security of having the data processed uh, on the edge directly onto the sensors, 
but as well as how the, the security of the actions coming from the central system towards, uh, for example, traffic lights or other types of systems, how to make sure that that's secure. So that security aspect, and that's more general than just saying one specific sector, will become a very important topic for the years to, for the years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, I think seeing as we're heading towards 11, I'll hand back to Maria Letizia to close. Yes, uh, thank you, Zach, and thank you everyone for participating today, for your availability, and thank you to the audience. Uh, I recommend, uh, obviously, we recommend to um, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, I put in the chat uh, uh, the, the link to subscribe to the newsletter. Um, some more dates for the webinars will be shared soon, so stay tuned. And uh, thank you for, for your participation today. Thank you for the, also um, to the speakers. It was very, very uh, interesting and uh, important, uh, let's say, date for, for us to start this kind of uh, webinar series. Have a good day, everyone.